When the world goes to war, momentous events can go unrecorded. It's up to the war correspondent to be at the right place at the right time and get the story back. In August 1939, reporter Claire Hollingworth was crossing the Polish border when she stumbled upon Hitler's invasion force. Photographer Harry Oakes was ordered to document a prison camp and walked into Belzen. And combat cameraman Billy Jordan was sent to a small town in the desert and found himself at El Alamein. In the summer of 1939, Claire Hollingworth, an inexperienced reporter for the Daily Telegraph, arrived in Katowice, Poland. Her assignment was to monitor the growing tensions along Poland's border with Germany. A year earlier, the Nazis had seized Czechoslovakia. With supplies in Poland scarce, Claire decided to go shopping in Germany. The border, of course, was closed, but open to, quote, flagged, unclosed cars. And I borrowed the consul, British Consul General's car to drive into Germany, where I bought aspirin and white wine and things you couldn't then buy in Poland. On her return, Claire stumbled upon what was to become the biggest story of her career. It was a, a valley, a steep valley, I knew quite well. And there was a screen on my left so that I couldn't look down in the valley. And suddenly, the oh, a sudden gust of wind blew the screen away and I looked down into the valley and saw scores, if not hundreds of tanks, already lined up, ready to go into Poland. Hidden behind a flimsy screen, Claire had stumbled on Hitler's secret, an army of over 60,000 troops massed for the invasion of Poland. The German 8th, 10th and 12th armies were poised for war. I drove back to Katowice and said to the Consul General, thank you for lending me your car. I, he, sa he said, did you really go into Germany, old girl? Everyone was old girl in those days. I said, yes, I did go into Germany. And if you don't believe me, you can see the things I bought inside Germany in the back of the car. But, I added, I've got an extremely good story because coming down the valley just near the border, I saw, as the tarpaulin was blown away from its hangar, scores, if not hundreds, of tanks already lined up for the invasion of Poland. After only a few weeks as a journalist, Claire's incredible scoop made headlines across the world. For Claire, one exclusive story would follow another. As dawn broke on the Polish border town of Katowice on the 1st of September 1939, Claire was woken by an ominous noise. She opened her bedroom window to have her worst fears realized. German tanks rolled in to the capital of Silesia, Katowice. The Polish army had failed to mobilize in time. The invading German forces raced from city to city, largely unopposed. Most of the people were not surprised. Many of them had got their swastikas already to put up. Others were horrified and jumped into their cars. With the biggest scoop of the year, Claire phoned her editor in Fleet Street and an incredulous British embassy. As we spoke to the embassy in Warsaw, they disbelieved the idea of the tanks were rolling down the main street of Katowice. So I just said, I put the telephone out of the window and said, can't you hear them? Live down the telephone line, the roar of German tanks heralded a turning point in history. Britain and France declared war against Germany within days. After just three weeks, Polish resistance had been swept aside and the country occupied. At the outbreak of war, Billy Jordan was an 18-year-old camera assistant earning four pounds a week on films such as Hitchcock's Jamaica Inn. He volunteered for the number one army film and photographic unit in 1941 and was shipped out to Cairo to record the 8th Army's progress in the desert campaign. Billy, equipped with the latest Army issue camera, the IMO, 
captured some of the most dramatic images of the war, the British bombardment at the start of the Battle of El Alamein. This is a night barrage at El Alamein. This is actual action, which was shot during the night barrage. And by looking at the screen now, you see the flashes are, are come quite often. In other words, it looks at the, the machine gun fire almost. I had the advantage of being able to adjust the speed on an IMO camera. I was coming, I'd come down as low as four frames a second. It speeded up the action, you got that flash of the gun. It's a good exposure on the flash of the gun and also a chance to get some kind of an exposure on the gunners themselves. It really was very effective indeed. Weeks later, the tables were turned on Billy when his bath time antics were captured on film. We went back once for a rest period and we were doing the bath unit. I mean, to have a bath was one of the, out of this world. I mean, wonderful, sitting up bath and mosh over. And someone had done it, was Peter Hopkinson, had a still camera with him. And there was me, and he was taking shots of me in the bath. So I'm cupping my legs up here, almost showing my private parts, not quite. And he went back as an official material. And what did that happen was he got published in the Daily Mirror. My folks back home saw that uh, their prodigal son sitting in a bath, Starkers, having a bath, and then cutting his toenail, and I'm going to shave, no, oh, no, I don't believe this. <laughs> Billy's next assignment was almost his last. On the 6th of April 1943, the year-long battle to break through the Marath line had ended, and Montgomery ordered the 8th Army into Tunis to mop up German resistance. Eager to film an enemy surrender, Billy leapt onto a passing armoured jeep. And I got some great stuff going along the road with the groups of, of, of enemy and so forth. Germans so were just standing there, hands up, surrender, like that. Great stuff. In the meantime, snipers in the, in the block of flats opened fire. Suddenly I felt bing and got, uh, you know, sharp pain on my backside. I banged on the armoured car top to, uh, problem with the flats across there, they swing around and open up fire on the block of flats. And suddenly up behind me comes a German people's guard with two German officers in. Again, I, I send the signal downstairs, you know, turn around. They swing the gun now, now back the other side of the camera. I can't see what's happening with the German, German uh, officers. And so the, the armoured car opens fire on the two German officers and kills them stone dead. In the meantime, just before they're killed, they throw a stick grenade at the armoured car, it just bounces on the side of the armoured car, just where I'm sitting, and doesn't explode, like, you know. Although wounded, Billy was most annoyed at not capturing his double brush with death on film. You can get your right up there amongst it, stick your head out as much as you like, and the action happens and you haven't got a foot of it. And that was the case at Tunis. I hadn't got a foot of two Germans literally being shot to pieces under my nose, being hit by snipers in a block of flats, and each time, I just happened to be facing in the wrong direction. <laughs> An upholsterer by trade, 23-year-old Harry Oakes volunteered for the Army Film and Photographic Unit in 1945. After three months training at Pinewood Studios, Harry was to film the 6th Airborne Division as they reinforced the Rhine Offensive. The plan was to land heavily laden gliders in enemy territory. Our pilot told us when we were free from the towing cable, and uh, he, he said, going in, chaps, and he started off by 400 feet, 450 feet, and so on, until he got the 100 feet. And then it was silence, and then there was an enormous crash. We found ourselves in the heap. Uh, the, the camera had flung up my hands. It was in the, in the dirt. Approaching the landing site, Harry's pilot had been shot by a German sniper. We, we had a captain with us, and he said, right, everybody out as soon as you can. And the only way out was by the door in the tail, and, and that was sticking up in the air about 10 or 12 feet. And there's an awful moment when you had to be famed, because we knew there snipers about. One of our chaps, the, the Devons, he got shot through the deck, and this captain said, right, make for that, the hedge over there, the ditch, which we did. And then he sent a couple of chaps off to sort out the snipers. Harry's career as a combat cameraman had begun. 
A month later, on the 16th of April, 1945, Harry, along with three colleagues, was dispatched to photograph a recently liberated POW camp. Driving through the German countryside, Harry had no idea that this assignment would haunt him for the rest of his life. It was quite lovely countryside, yeah. And we began to think of this lovely open countryside with pine trees, and so much so that we missed number one camp altogether. And we finished up at Bergen-Belsen in, in the barrack area. The team set about filming the camp's activities. An infantry officer turned up and said, look, you chaps are wasting your time. Because if you came from Vincent, you must have passed number one camp over to your left. And it's the way he said it and the look in his eyes that caused us to drop it immediately and go back. And sure enough, we found this number one camp. Nestling in the midst of a pine forest lay the top secret Nazi death camp of Belsen. As he entered the camp, Harry was bewildered by what he saw. Harry and his colleagues were among the first photographers into Belsen. Drove all the way through the camp, seeing all these people, dreadful skeletons, walking skeletons, bloodless bodies. We couldn't, we couldn't understand it. There was a woman there, and she said, um, if you'd like to come in the camp, we'll show you something. And we left our cameras with the driver in, in the Jeep, went in this compound, and she went to this marquee and pulled open the flats. And to my heart and everybody else's heart, it was, it was stuffed with corpses about five or six feet high. We had a tightening in the throat. You know, we, we couldn't speak. We couldn't speak to each other. It occurred to me afterwards that we never did a shot of this. We, we did toy the idea of going back, but it, it's so horrible. We, didn't, we couldn't go back there. It's so horrible. At Belsen, Hitler's final solution had accounted for the lives of tens of thousands of Jews. In the last days of the camp, SS guards fled leaving scores of open graves. The, the very shock of seeing the first one, you know, a, a, actual, a mass grave, literally thousands of corpses, or hundreds anyway, even to begin with, even when there's just enough corpses to cover the bottom of the pit, it was enormous. What shocked Harry was to stun the world as his team's horrific pictures made the front pages. We had, we had to show the worst, as it poss possibly was. We, we weren't faking anything. After all, we only showing what was there. We, we probably wouldn't have been feeling we were doing our job had we not shown how bad it really was. The unit's photographers set about documenting every aspect of the Nazi atrocities. Harry still remembers taking one particular picture. One of the worst, I think, was the bulldozer shoveling the corpses along. I think the, the first chap, I think the Royal Engineers had that job. And I think the first chap who had the job, he was led, he couldn't do it. That must have been awful to have done that. You, you had to think they weren't corpses at all. They were everlasting burning clothes to kill the lice that was causing the spreading typhus. And to this day, uh, even on Guy Fawkes night, when they burned him to Guy, I've got to walk away. After the war, Harry Oakes left photojournalism behind and began a new career as a movie cameraman. Billy Jordan had filmed with the 8th Army in the heat of battle, from Cairo to the landings in Italy. Then the Allied advance was halted, held up by the German stronghold at Monte Cassino. Billy decided to move up to the front line. And I tried to crawl into the town itself, to the foot of, of the monastery. But I didn't get very far along the road, there shell holes and everything else. And I, as soon as I put my head above, boom, I was getting everything thrown at me. I thought well, that was no good, I couldn't film there, so I crawled back. And when I got back to the end of the road, there was a small little building, and I found in there a stretcher party of, of uh, medics. The medics were there, and they looked at me and said, what's that? I said, well, it's a camera. 
And some clown said, you're not taking holiday snaps up here, are you? And I said, no, no, seriously, I want to try and get some real close shots of Casino. And they said, well, tell you what, the distracted party goes out here. We go out maybe once or twice a day uh, and pick up our wounded. I said, well, that makes great stuff. I said, can I come? He said, yeah, sure. And the distracted party went off. And they went down the centre of the road. Well, being a cameraman, I suddenly just heard a conversation that I wanted. Castle Hill, the hill on, on, sorry, on the right. Monastery way up on the hill on the left. And the stretcher party going through the centre. Now, I had to let them get about 20 or 30 yards in front of me before I, I turned my camera on. So I thought my composition of the, of the situation went down on one knee with the armo camera up to my face. And there was a mortar bomb right by my side. Not only did it have my name on it, it had my address on it as well. And I just took the full blast of that mortar bomb and I didn't know any more. Billy's injuries were so severe, he wasn't expected to live. He remained unconscious for four days. My left arm was in plaster. I was bound, wrapped like round there, solid. And up my nose were tubes and out my mouth was tubes. So I was, you know, a crazy situation and an absolute mess. And my face was almost blackened by the blast. I'd taken full blast into my face. The photographic unit's commitment to recording frontline warfare exacted a heavy toll. Out of a unit of only 26 cameramen, two were captured, five seriously injured, and seven were killed. And that small unit, their, their job was 90% of the time to be up front filming actual material that was happening. If you keep your head down, you won't get any film. I was always looking for that, that shot, that, that one thing that uh, it says, oh, terrific. And it could be a, a tank getting a direct hit and, and bursting into flames. It could be a man just being shot and straight in the middle of your, your frame. Seeing even the fiercest battle through a viewfinder gave a false sense of security to the camera operator. You put a camera up in front of your face. You, you limit yourself to that viewfinder's field of vision and you're enclosed on that full square like that and it gave you a little bit of confidence in, in saying well i'm safe here look what i'm filming now that's fine it's good be taken away from you know, it it's a, it's a different matter entirely and, and to try and get shells exploding i mean i had no warning for it's coming i mean you'd be there saying boom the one had gone over there and you'd be there and something's over there it was that kind of thing, and uh, it was unfortunate that a lot of material you shot didn't have that aspect of um, immediacy of, of, of shell fire or real action. And that's why I'm afraid what crept into the situation there was reorganising and you can call it phony material, reenactment. The need for this dramatic footage was met by a British film, <laughs> Desert Victory. Although Allied troops had gained ground on the battlefield, the Germans were still winning the propaganda war. Churchill came under increasing pressure from Stalin and other Allied leaders to prove the British really were defeating Germany in the desert campaign. Churchill ordered the shooting of Desert Victory and made it clear that if the most dramatic footage could not be achieved on the battlefield, it was to be reconstructed and passed off as the real thing. Desert Victory was uh, a film made uh out all the material shot during the desert campaign up from El Alamein, starting off with the night barrage of El Alamein and then going right through to Tunis. It involved a lot of action material, made a very, very good uh, documentary film indeed. In fact, it won an Oscar when shown in America. The unfortunate thing about Desert Victory was there was a lot of uh, reenacted material such as this of people charging through smoke screens or whatever with fixed bayonets or guns in the position, pipers and everything else, was all shot around, I hate to say it, around the pyramids. I think the cameraman stayed at a very nice hotel in Giza before he went and did his operation of firing. Now that it's so phony, it's not true. There was a foreground of troops and an explosion almost sent to the frame. I mean, stuff like that, going through smoke, not there. 
But I must confess, they do rather look like they're going on a Sunday afternoon trot. But you can see your glorious troops in action. I mean, this, this is fair enough shooting because there's no problem here, just 25 pounder firing. But then when you see an explosion, almost dead centre screen, I say, well, he's working it so he's reconstructed that shot. He put an explosion in the ground before he's actually turned the camera over. It made me cringe at times to think that you know, people were co killed up front trying to get the material, and yet there was someone behind the pyramids staying at a very nice hotel, uh, and uh, that was it, and they were getting all the kudos. Churchill was so pleased with the film, he personally sent a copy to Stalin. However, Billy's dislike of reenactments didn't stop the temptation to stage shots. I was covering the Gurkhas. Now, we'd heard there'd been a big battle on the Gurkhas in a true manner, had been great soldiers, they'd push, pushed the enemy off of the ridge and everything else, and the enemy were in full retreat. Now, we got to the situation where it was all over. And they saw we had cameras in our hand and so forth. So one of the majors in charge of the girl said, uh, I tell you what, it would please our men immensely if you could take some film of them. The reactions were so over the top, it wasn't true. I mean, Brando would have done it better or somebody else, you know. They'd get to the top of the ridge and they'd do one, ah, oh, and just slow sink into the ground. <laughs> it was pathetic. Well, they'd one or two shots like that. But the rest was a mass of, of Gurkhas going up the hill. It was great stuff, good stuff. And I said, well, you know, phony. I didn't say it was phony. I just sent it back as material shot in the desert. Did you feel guilty about that? I do a bit, but with, knowing the Gurkhas, they are the greatest fighters in the world. I thought, to myself, oh, mates, you deserve this, so bugger it, you know, and going back to real material, like it or leave it. And that's what happened. But it, it was so obvious it was phony material, the way they were, the chap on the hill was dying. It, it literally was a classic example of bloody bad acting. You know, just sort of that, and that, that slow, uh, and, and the cry with it as well. Billy left the army for Pathé News at the end of the war in 1945, and went on to have a long and distinguished career in news and film. When I look back on it, I think to myself, well, it was a bit hairy, but I didn't think I was doing anything out of the ordinary. It was what I was after it was mainly just pictures and recordings of on film. The footage you, you showed me here is the first time I've ever seen it. And I was amazed at the quality. But uh, you know, I think today you would have put that lot in the bin. By watching and recording history being made, the war correspondents have themselves become a part of it. It's recorded, it's down there as a record. And you say, well, I did that. Billy Jordan's gone down in history. 